Um, the next section in our presentations is the drillers panel. And uh, I consider this uh, a very necessary and important part of our conference. You know, a lot of the folks that we work with are sanitarians or realtors or labs or regulators. And, um, you know, there's a big disconnect in a lot of cases between uh, what the drillers are doing and what the county folks are doing. And so um, we see in different states this works different ways. And sometimes they work in great cooperation. Other times they're kind of adversarial and all those things. And so it's really important that the drillers have a chance uh, to have a voice, give their opinion on some things. And those of you here that were here at the 2017 conference remember how that was a, was a great 90-minute session. And so we've got uh, four very distinguished drillers here. They're all part of the NGWA board, which we're very lucky to have. And uh, so they all have a lot of experience and uh, a lot of wherewithal as far as uh, the industry and what's going on moving forward. And they're all from different parts of the country. So um, each one is going to take 15 minutes uh, to, to talk about uh, their perspective about uh, the water well and private well industry and how it relates to health protection and all those things. And then at the end, we'll have 30 minutes for questions. And so um, we'll wait till the end to do them for all four. All right. And this is Richard Lehman, who's from Michigan. Yep. And he's going to start us off. Thank you. Let's see if we can get this to work. Thank you, guys. Uh, drilling wells in northern Michigan can create uh, a lot of a lot of uh, problems in, in actually drilling water wells there. It's a diverse in geological formations up there. In, in as little as five, five miles, you can go from 300 foot of drift, sand and gravel wells, to limestone at or near the surface. Uh, five miles from my shop, which is 330 feet to the, to the Black Antrim Shale, uh, they're sinkholes, dry sinkholes and wet sinkholes. Uh, our area is known for uh, the sinkholes. There's probably 15, 20 of them within five miles, probably seven miles of my shop. Uh, drilling can be challenging in this, this, this type of formation. Uh, we run into a lot of voids and caverns in the limestone where you, use lost, where you have lost circulation. And uh, we have different methods that we can use to get through and make water wells. Evolution of pure water well. I moved up north, northern part of Michigan in 1987, worked for my uncle for about two years, and then started my own business, pure water well drilling. I started with just a, a cable tool rig and a water truck. Uh, and we grew my business to, in 2000, we bought our second rotary, a uh, brand new rotary, and uh, we were running close to 200 wells a year back then. Uh, in 1972, I drilled my first water well at a ripe old age of 12 years old. Was, this was in uh, Pontiac, Michigan, and it was kind of a dare between my dad and his two partners who also had children about my age, and who, who could get their kid to drill the well first. Uh, this well was a 96-foot deep, four-inch well for malls, carpet, and uh, furniture. And my brother, Philip, who's still running the original layman business down there in Kego Harbor, uh, he abandoned that well about five years ago. So that, that's that's pretty good life out of that. Uh, in, uh, see. I've grown my business with the help of my family and friends to what it is today. I am the president of Pure Water Well Incorporation, past president and continuing member of the Michigan Groundwater Association where I've been a member for over 35 years. I'm a member of the National Groundwater Association. Uh, a certified master groundwater contractor through the NGWA and a certified vertical closed loop driller through the NGWA. I'm currently a board member of the NGWA 
and uh, fourth generation water well driller. Service. Service is the bread and butter of most water well drilling companies. Uh, it gets you out there in contact with individuals. Uh, it also leads you into repairs and new construction for wells. Uh, we have two service crews running full time and an installation crew. Uh, somebody did turn the lights to. I thought I was too. We were just joking about everyone's going to fall asleep after lunch. <laughs> so they put me up here first. Okay. Uh, there we go. Wake up. Uh, that doesn't, this doesn't control that, I don't think. Okay. Uh, when I first moved into the area, the well drillers drilled wells and the plumbers installed the pumps and well systems. Uh, through my efforts and a lot of hard work, the homeowners and the plumbers actually uh, refer to me when it comes to doing the full job. Uh, we, uh, we, have, we have been doing uh, service on wells, uh, repairs, disinfection, uh, real estate uh, appraisals for uh, well inspections. We do a, a little bit of everything there. Uh, next slide. We also have diverse weather in Michigan. This is a picture we took around Mother's Day in May. I think it was last year. And we pulled the rig on the job that morning, and that was green grass. Uh, <laughs> a snow squall blew in from Lake Huron. Luckily, we had some plywood on the job. They were tearing the house down and they had some plywood there. We threw it up because the wind was blowing 20, 30 mile an hour. The snow was coming horizontal and we were trying to drill this well. Uh, the next day it was all thawed and turned to mud. And when we finished the well, we went to pull out and we buried the rig. So this, this slide will cause a little laughter. Uh, my daughter found this on the internet and she posted it. <laughs> If you've ever been around well drillers, the topic at the table will be about wells. That's all we know to talk about. Uh, and my wife's back there, she could attest to this. <laughs> Working with regulatory agencies, well permits. Michigan started well permits probably 15 years ago. It took a while to get all the way across the state, but 100% of the state requires well permits or well notification forms. Uh, this opens up a lot more uh, work for everyone, especially the well drillers, uh, to fill out the permits properly and get all the paperwork in to even be able to drill the water wells. Uh, well construction in our area, we are a resort uh, vacation home area. Alpena County has 12,000 people in the whole county and I would say 4,000 of them leave in the winter. Uh, so we have a lot of cabins, uh, summer homes, and hunting camps. So we have a lot of diverse challenges when it comes to installing wells and where to put pressure tanks and make it an easy uh, ease for drainage systems down. Uh, excuse me for a minute, okay. Here's a typical buried installation tank. The pressure tanks in the lower part of the pitcher, uh, a little cut off. The at well control comes up to the side of the well. An approved pitless well cap is on there, vented, waterproof, uh, and a shut off drain valve. Uh, if you notice, the water line in the right hand side there is just coming up above ground. This was for uh, mobile home. Uh, the people were bringing the mobile home in to this lake lot uh, for a few years before they could build their home, afford to build their home, and install the septic in the well. And they wanted a well first so they could uh, 
get some water. Difficulties in drilling areas. Uh, diversity in geological strata. Emerging contaminants, PFAS, uh, bedrock wells through shale, limestone, sandstone, sand and gravel wells, high pressure artesian flows uh, produce in low producing areas, and uh, designing screen to work with both. Uh, we, we have areas in our, our area up there that uh, you can drill 500 foot wells and get a half a gallon a minute. Uh, storage in the well, added storage in the house, um, usually a higher water table can get you by in most households for the, for the demand. Uh, but also in the same area, you can get high pressure artesian flows uh, in the neighborhood of, uh, through a five inch casing, 150, 200 gallon a minute at 35 to 50 PSI. Uh, dealing with these wells are very challenging. I got a slide here showing. This is a five inch PVC well flowing 100 gallon a minute. It carried 37 PSI without a pump in it. It was unique in hooking this up because we just, that's a pitless mouth mounted on there with a two inch ball valve. Uh, that's the only way we could get the plug in the top because it had so much volume and pressure we couldn't push the plug down and thread it in. Uh, we tap into this down below frost and run a water, one inch water line in and we hook a booster pump to it. Uh, Grunfoss makes a really good uh, booster pump, an MQ or Solus, Scolus, Scolus. Uh, all it does is it just boosts pressure up to 50 or 60 pounds wherever you want it set for the house. Very unique system there. This well, my daughter put on there, another flowing well. This was kind of neat. We were developing a 10 inch well out and we initially developed it until the water was fairly clear. And then we shut the compressor down. We're sitting there eating a sandwich and this thing started blowing again like that. And what it was is it was a trapped aquifer down there. It was uh, 35 feet thick in between two clay lenses, about 247 feet deep. And the air, excess air from the air compressor, because we were blowing from the bottom of the screen, had became trapped between the two layers of clay. And after we shut this thing down and the water was returning, this trapped air started coming back in and the well started blowing on its own. It was very unique. Five minutes. Okay. Drilling with foam. Uh, most drillers will look at this and see one thing. There, there's a nice stream of foam coming out of this well. And it's also tan, so we're in the Traverse limestone. Uh, not a lot of water coming yet. If you look at the well rig, there's no rods in the carousel and no rods in the side of the drill rack. I carry 400 foot of drill rods on this rig. We had five more drill rods laying on that tub when we did hit the water when we finally got down. So this well ended up almost 500 feet deep. Here's the different types of well rigs that we have to use daily up there in my area. Uh, to the west of me, there's a lot of two inch wells, uh, a lot of hunting camps that have two inch wells, hand pump wells on them and stuff. So I have a two inch well rig hollow rod jetting machine there in the middle. I have a cable tool rig, four inch 20 W, that we drill a lot of four inch wells in, uh, in tight spots, areas, sometimes there's areas where there's only a two foot vein of uh, sand. And it helps to drill with the cable tool because you can get into that two foot vein of sand, not disturb it with the mud from the mud rotary and make better wells. The rotary is set up on a unique place. It's in uh, calcite. Uh, it's up in Charmoose bought it up in Rogers City. It's an open pit mine. They mine limestone out of there primarily for the aggregate and for the steel industry. That well is set up on, a, on over top of a tunnel in between the buildings. And we drilled a six inch well there that's 370 feet deep. Uh, that water is just used for one thing. They, they load their ships with volumes of water and limestone. The limestone is created in a slurry and they pump it in the ships 
and then the ships bilge the water out. Well, the limestone was wearing away at the packing faces and they're, they're huge centrifugal pumps. These things are 13 feet high, 36 inch pipes going in and out. So the engineers come up with an idea to inject water at 100 PSI at the packing flange face inside the pump to keep the limestone away from the packing and thus the pumps would last longer. So that's what that well was for. Here's that irrigation well hooked up. Uh, we ended up getting 1,100 gallons a minute out of it. That's the lead of a 1,300 foot uh, irrigation pivot right there. And then there's a second line that goes out that goes to a 900 footer on the other side of this field. This, this field covers just about a mile square section. This slide right here, they were digging a new water sewer line across this field north part of Alpena, and they ran into an old six inch well. This well was 720 feet deep. It was drilled for a tannery back in the late 1800s. This well was flowing almost 350 gallons a minute, and the casing was perforated, looked like Swiss cheese. So what we ended up having to do, another well driller, Shepler Well Drilling, was working on this site and uh, asked me to come help him, and we ended up uh, lowering four inch steel casing down to 100 feet and cementing that in so we could get some casing that had integrity. And then we pressure grouted this from the top with uh, 470 bags of cement. Disinfecting wells, it, it brings a whole new challenge. Uh, you can see the uh, high pressure flows. You have to bulk displace, bulk displace the water uh, to get your contact time. Uh, dead end lines, water filtration, people, a lot of people do not realize, but water filters and water softeners get installed after the fact, and they're never disinfected, never cleaned, never uh, uh, taken care of. This is a picture of insect infestation on a water well at a township hall. The water well cap was a slip over style well cap. We changed this out to a watertight cap. There's a, a mock well set up in the back corner there. You can look at what a water tight, watertight well cap and a pitless and pump can look like there. This right here is a well. Believe it or not, it was in Florida at a restaurant, but I had to take a picture of it. That tree is about five feet in diameter. It's a live oak. Now, how would you like to work, repair, or abandon that well? And I would like to thank you. Hey, I forgot to mention that uh, they aren't, the talks aren't necessarily in the order that they're speaking. So like this was the second talk, uh, and this is Jeff Williams, uh, who's going to speak next. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon. Oh. Hope everybody had a good lunch. I know. I'm going to have to stand on the block pretty soon, Todd. <laughs> Hope everyone had a good lunch. Um, Richard did a great job of not putting everybody to sleep. Good, good job, Richard. We're going to try to make up. Each one of us is going to take a little bit longer and longer so David, we don't hear from him at the end of the day. <laughs> he knows I'm only kidding. Communication. Critical components for su successful dialogue between the various groups of groundwater professionals. I have pretty much dedicated my entire career to communication and the successful exchange of information and technology. Um, that has been uh, the highlight of my entire career in, in the water well drilling business. Thank goodness that uh, my father, brother, and uncle would carry me so I can come and play at things like this. So, family business, hoorah. So I'm the VP of Spafford and Sons because everybody said after I got out of school that I couldn't find a real job unless it was working for my father. So maybe they were right, it's the only job I've ever had. 39 years uh, in June, I'm a licensed Vermont water well contractor. I have a, I'm a licensed Vermont specialty plumber for filtration and commercial pressure tank installation. 
uh, ICSPA accredited GS at HP installer. Longstanding member of NGWA, uh, been really heavily involved since 2006. Uh, I was the president of Vermont Groundwater Association from 1997 to 2006. NGWA Board of Directors from 2009 to 2017. So for those of you in the wastewater business, I'm about two logs of has-been. So. And the 2018 Robert Storm Award recipient for intersectional cooperation. So this is how it was done. Richard showed a few uh, slides of cable tools, uh, the old way of, of pounding your way down through and getting down through the bedrock or whatever the geology was in order to craft a, a water well. And that's what we used in this slide right here. These are wells that we drilled in the jungles of Sierra Leone, West Africa in 2012. We went in and drilled eight wells for four different villages. We used a cable tool. They're, they range from maybe 42 feet deep to 120 feet deep, and they all have hand pumps in them, and they run from daylight to dark. Sunrise, sunset, every day, all day, with a line of people with jugs going to them. Margaret alluded in her presentation to the need for uh, potable water in this country uh, for the people that can't afford it that don't have access. I was fortunate enough to be able to go and, and do something out of the country, uh, in, in a third world country where I wasn't sure the first day I was gonna live to see uh, an industrialized nation again. Um, it's a very different experience. But the need is great here and sometimes we overlook that and it takes us a while to be able to see the big picture. So what's important? Clear standards and expectations of performance. That's what's important. Let's communicate. We gotta have clear expectations and a clear set of standards that we go by to be able to construct that water supply appropriately for the geology that we're constructing it in and for the application. So if I get a detail for a residential water well and somebody wants to use that in a commercial application, that's not the right application for that because the diameter of a water well is predicated on what are we gonna put in for a pump? What are we gonna use this for? What are our flow rates? What diameters do we need to be able to accept what we're gonna put in it? We worked long and hard at NGWA on the NGWA 01 construction standards for all wells. That was a, a, a decades long or better process to get to a place where we could have a standard that covers all water wells, regardless of their application. Communication, communication, communication. We have to all communicate back and forth, clearly and openly. We have to be able to talk. If we can't talk, we're not gonna do the right things out there. We're not, we're not gonna give to the regulators and uh, health department officials, whoever is overseeing our industry, we have to know what you're looking for so that we can say, this is how I think we're gonna do it. Richard talked about applications and flowing wells and different geology. Uh, and, and we get stuff thrown at us just in real time that we can't see and we have to adjust and adapt to those conditions. So Vermont has a technical advisory committee, the TAC. Governor Dean set that up back in 98 and I was on the original group. So the TAC is comprised of everyone. We have a tremendous cross-section of people. We met once a month there for a long time, and I think now it's, it's every other month, and maybe it's still once a month, but I think it's every other month, right? Yeah. Um, in the old days, we had rules and regulations and standards, but we didn't have any communication. So as well drillers, we did not have a seat at the table. So you either have a seat at the table or you're on the menu. And that's <laughs> Kenny, Kenny White, that, I'm just gonna give him credit for that. Kenny said that. If, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. But what does that really mean? It means that your intelligence or your ability or your thoughts are never put into guidance. And as a water well drilling community, 
we do a really good job at keeping everything a secret. We keep it, we try to keep it in, right? We, we're going to hold that. I'm not going to tell him what I'm doing over there because he'll set up shop next door. So, you know, that, that's that frame of mind that, that's been through the, through the decades. Um, we've broken through many of those barriers, but it's that, that spirit of communication and acceptance of everyone's abilities that has got us to where we are today. So the new process is very comprehensive and inclusive. So water well drillers are an independent bunch. We had a pretty independent conversation here at lunch over a subject. Thank goodness you guys are out somewhere else because the, the three of us have lively discussions from time to time. So we have to be, what do we have to be to be a, to be a well driller? We have to be a truck driver. We have to be able to weld, cut, fabricate, run a business. We have to design water systems. We have to be plumbers, electricians, geologists by de facto, and, and also well drillers. I mean, there's so many things that go along with that. You, you never know where you're going to be at the end of the day. And I left out water treatment and scientists and all that because that's just another piece of what we do. And most water well contractors are small family-owned enterprises. Most of us lack what I would call corporate infrastructure. So a family-owned business where you know, the father goes out and runs a drill rig every day, the kids go out in the field, they all come home, they all have supper, they make their phone calls at night, and nobody has time to go out, reach out, and be involved in, in activities that are either statewide or national activities like where we are today. So it's important for, I think, as a regulatory group, to reach out to some of these mom and pop organizations and, and communicate with them as well because they're, they're the backbone of our industry. Most of our companies in NGWA databases are less than five people, less than $500,000 a year in gross revenue. That doesn't give you much time to go do anything else. So, and the vast majority of contractors are very hardworking and respectful people, and we all work hard for a living. We do so many things to make that happen. And some of us, and some have college degrees. Uh, most are probably high school education. And my father, for example, graduated from the eighth grade. So he's 77 years old, and he still runs a drilling rig today. He doesn't know anything any different. And I wouldn't take him away from that. We've got to keep him out there, because then I know where he is. He's not bothering me. <laughs> so I, I told him last week, and I continually remind him of, of how he's going to go. We're just going to have a pine box in the back of the truck, and then when we think it's your day, we're just going to make sure that truck is on site, and you'll fall right off the platform, right into the box, and we'll take it right to the undertaker. And he jokes about it, and he knows it's all light fun, but, but that's what's going to happen. It's just because that's what he wants to do. And if that's what he wants to do, that's what I want him to do. So this is what we're running today. We're running very modern equipment that has more than doubled in price in the last five to six years. You talk about a learning curve. When you've got to, when you've got to have uh, asset allocation at double the rate that we used to have to have it, um, then you've got to be in front of that, and most of us are not in front of that. Most are behind that curve, running outdated older equipment with no real means or a real plan to get back to the front again. Shift on the fly. Richard talked a little bit about changing conditions in overflowing wells. So I get a call this morning. We got 15 gallons a minute coming over the top. What do you want to do? I said, well, we're going to drill a 600-foot hole to get as much as we can because it's for a municipal supply. We're going five to 600 feet because we want it all, and, and they need it all. Well, last Thursday, they set the casing and grouted it with midnight grout. Friday morning, I get the call that it's flowing right up the outside of the casing that the, the bent night grout didn't hold. We were fortunate enough to be able to pull the casing, ream the hole, regrout it with neat cement, and we got it. 
thank goodness we got it, and we didn't find out today that we had a flowing well because we wouldn't be able to control the interior flow. So I'm really I'm thankful that we had an we had an annular flow so that we could properly get it constructed to be able to contain an inside flow, and there's not another well around there that flows over. Who knew, right? You don't know. Sometimes we have no idea. We, we, we deal with so much and so many things that you can't see. When I'm standing there running a drill, I, look, I, I close my eyes and I envision of what we're drilling through down there so I can better uh, construct as well. And you have to have that kind of vision in order to be a water well driller, in order to be a good one. So oversight. We know that uh, uh, officials and regulators have, their, everybody has a job to do. And I, my point of view is that we're all in this together. And that we're going to communicate, we're going to talk, we're going to have open discussion, and we're going to come up with the solutions that are appropriate. You have to keep the lines of communication open. So a desktop design to an as-built is a very different looking animal most of the time. NGWA's campaign is that we're better together. Thank you, David. That's something that uh, we've all had passion for and David has really taken it home. Um, the open communication, we're better together, mantra is something that benefits our industry as well as protecting the Earth's groundwater. So no matter, no matter the makeup of your region, it's possible to involve all groundwater stakeholders in the discussion. So we have to be comprehensive. All the stakeholders need to be at the table. In Vermont, I think it's a model for that. I really do. I think that we have all the stakeholders at the table and everybody has a voice. Everybody has an equal voice. Uh, and you know, the regulators are there and they listen and I, I think it's a great relationship and I think we're doing a great job there. And I really do believe that water well contractors aren't near as scary as they look. Well, except for Todd. Todd's a little scary. Sometimes he's a lot scary, comes at you. We have a few resources. The NGWA 0114 Water Well Construction Standard. Um, that's a great resource. That was put together by all the stakeholders in our industry, uh, facilitated by the National Groundwater Association. Boy, had to have started in, what, 06, 07 maybe, something like that. They had the first meetings on it. Wellowner.org for any questions that you can, anybody that calls into your offices and you need someone to answer technical questions, if they can't answer them there, they'll reach out to us out in the field. And on this list, any questions when it comes to rules, regulations, NGWA is a tremendous database and I use it very frequently. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Um, our next speaker is Todd Hunter, um, who's from Colorado. So we tried to, you know, one, have people from different perspectives in different parts of the country as well. So we're really glad Todd's here. I know last time we had Illinois, Indiana, or Illinois, Michigan, and Minnesota, I think. So uh, you're the West Coast speaker, just so you know. You have a lot of... The West Coast speaker. Yeah, I'll try not all, to fall off all the on you. stage so. here. Um, with Jeff, he's got my microphone, like usually I have to jump for anything that Jeff has been near. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, I, I, it's funny kind of the way it comes together. Um, Richard, Jeff, David, and myself, uh, we all work quite closely together and have done so for a number of years, but it, it's, it's kind of ironic that we never really planned what we were going to talk about. We never really, we don't have a proven agenda, if you will. We don't have, you know, I'm going to talk about this, you're going to talk about that. We all just collectively collaborated with uh, Katie and she said, hey, send us your PowerPoints. And amazingly, uh, we came together and, and we almost fit in unison in, in the order of the program. So what I'm going to do, I'll talk a bit. You know, Richard gave you some preface on, you know, what, what it's like out there in the real world. Jeff gave you uh, uh, some indication as to what it's like in Jeff's world. Um, that's a unique place. Um, I'm going to talk about practical standards and best practices. So uh, practical standards and best practices, it, it's... 
it's a conundrum, and, and I'll hopefully be able to explain a bit of that, uh, you know, in my talk. So, if I have a hard time reading that, my name is Todd Hunter. I'm a certified well driller, a pump installer from Boulder, Colorado. Um, I'm the owner and president of Boulder GWS LLC. I've got uh, five companies under one roof, essentially, or a combined uh, group of companies that I've purchased over the years. And, and we, uh, we get to do a lot of fun stuff. I'll hopefully show you a slide or two. Um, I'm the 2017 N NGWA board president. I was involved in the NGWA board of directors from 2010 to 2018. Um, I'm a past member and chair of the Standards Development Oversight Committee. Jeff was talking about uh, our NGWA standard. Uh, John Pitts and myself, back in 2008, I believe it was, sequestered ourselves at headquarters in Ohio at NGWA and kind of kicked off that standard as you see it today. I, I chaired that uh, committee, the SDO, uh, through the public comment period for the ANSI, at that time, ANSI standard for NGWA, uh, for water well construction standards. Um, I was an active member at CWWCA Board of Directors for many years. Um, I chaired the Rules Review Committee there. Um, I was also a part of the technical working group, which kind of keyed in to the Rules Review Committee. And, and what, what I was tasked with, at least at CWWCA in my own mind, now we'll, we'll talk a bit about CWWCA in Colorado later, um, you know, there's two diverse camps. There's two diverse camps in the industry about, uh, you know, those of us that, that treat it as a business and respect the resource and understand the complexities in, in making those two statements together. So my... my uh, time with CWWCA was, was really good. It, it allowed me to be a stakeholder um, with the latest set of rules revision in 2016. Um, and, and what I've done, I think, is, is tried my best to make a better product uh, to protect the resource, protect the, the industry, and obviously to protect the homeowner. Uh, I've done a lot of stuff in a lot of different areas, 38 states, Alaska, and the Aleutian chain. I spent uh, 20 years of my life on the road uh, taking a drilling program uh, to, to very uh, unique and, and difficult locations. Um, my company, like I say, it's a group of five. Um, we're water well systems installers. Uh, we're water well professionals generally. We move water from point A to point B. Uh, we're not all about water wells. We're a lot about water. Um, my company started originally in 1948 as Norris and Sons Drilling, much like Jeff's company, much like David's company, exactly like Richard's company. A small company started by a group of individuals that, that really cared and loved what they did and, and managed to make, uh, make a living at it. So, you know, obviously since 1948, we've apparently done something right. I wasn't involved with it till 1980, and, and I purchased uh, a group of companies from the guy that I worked for for a number of years uh, back in 2000. Uh, so a bit of a bit of those projects. Uh, that's kind of a, just a collage of of stuff. But if you look at the at the upper left hand corner, uh, for those of you that that can see it, I you know it's it's smaller. I don't know how well you can see it, but that drill rig right there, that's the ship that took the rig to the island of Attu, which is the westernmost island in the Aleutian chain. We did an emergency uh, water system replacement and repair for the Coast Guard Loran station on the island of Attu. Uh, if any of you guys know, anybody know where Attu is? Has anybody been there? It's one of the most pristine, beautiful, and remote areas in the world today. It's uh, often, often people don't understand it. They don't know it was one of the very few places in World War II that was actually occupied by the Japanese. One of the bloodiest battles was fought on the island of Attu. Um, we took a drill rig out there on very short notice. We had, uh, we had about a two-week window to... to take it forward, and uh, we put it on this fuel barge, which ironically only went once a year. So we loaded as much stuff as we could onto the fuel barge, and we got it on time, and, and the fuel barge set off. Well, now we're saying, okay, how are we going to do that? We've got our rigs going to, to uh, two. we got to get there. Uh, how are we going to do that? So in, in a matter of weeks, we put together a project that allowed us to go out there, um, meet the ship, uh, kind of size up the location. The first time I actually ever had been to the island was the day they dropped the, the drill rig, and it was just circumstance. I mean, we had planned a trip. You fly out of Kodiak on a military C-130, uh, land on the island of Attu, which is hit and miss at best. So you're lucky to get there. Uh, 200 days a year is, is rainy, windy. Uh, actively, you get 10 or 15 days a year where you actually see the sun. So it's, a, it's kind of a remote and wild place. Well, so the challenge there was, do we, uh, 
you know, leave the drill rig there for the fuel barge the next year, or, or do we uh, find a way to get it back out? So the way to get it back out, we actually took the drill rig and all the equipment apart in pieces and flew it out on two separate C-130s, reassembled it in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, number of projects there, Gunnison, I was telling these guys, uh, if, you, if you look, uh, there's a big haul pack. That's an 1,800-acre ranch in, in Gunnison uh, for a, a very uh, well-known individual in the nation. Um, a unique project. We did uh, two stints of eight weeks each over a two-year period and did about 64,000 gallons of storage all around the ranch. Uh, the, center, the center there, that's what I call the BAC. That's a big ass crane. So we, uh, we get to play with some fun stuff. So rules and regulations. Uh, rules and regulations, practical applications, standards and actual practice, best practices, and acceptable results. Does any, anybody see how those things tie together? Does anybody understand uh, generally how those things can affect you or, or anyone engaged in, in our industry? Uh, you know, that's the challenge. And what I'm going to try to do is I'll present, you know, just one simple analogy in the rules and regulations in the state of Colorado and it, it kind of help frame that conversation. But without rules and regulations, you can't have standards. Without standards, you really can't have practical applications. Uh, you know, they all tie together in some fashion. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. So Article 91 in the state of Colorado, basically what Article 91 is, legislature requires in the state of Colorado that there are rules and regulations, and they have a governing body that uh, supports and or enforces those rules and regulations. So the rules and regulations are written in a way that, that says, you know, don't mess it up. Don't mess it up, but here's the, here's the minimum standard. This is, this is the least acceptable thing that we will allow. So think about that, you know, as we go forward, because the minimum standard says something, but to some people it says something entirely different. So basically what Article 91 does, Article 91 tasks the BOE, it tasks a, a, a governing body with the authority, don't mess it up, protect the resource, protect the consumer, um, you know, the CWWCA, the, the local association in Colorado, they, they consider it a, a, a different relationship oftentimes. It's, it's us and them instead of just us together. So, you know, I think the better together thing is, is one of those uh, situations where our regulators, at least in the state of Colorado, would be well served to understand that, as would the contractors. Uh, basically what it says, you know, the order of development of the groundwater resource state of Colorado ensure the protection of the public health and prevent degradation of groundwater resource. Uh, you know, I, I, I could go on and on and on about that statement alone. Um, basically 10.1.1, if, if site-specific conditions indicate that adherence to the minimum standard will not ensure the adequate integrity of the product, it's up to the contractor, it's up to guys like, like us like you, to understand that, you know, the minimum standard is not going to work here. I got to do something different because I have to make, A, a successful project. I'd like to get paid for it at the end of the day, and I want my customer to be happy. So 10.1.1 for me is, is really the, uh, the guiding principle, if you will, in, in what I consider rules and regulations in the state of Colorado. 10.1.2 uh, basically says, hey, you got to know your stuff. You can't just go out and take people's money. And, and provide less than satisfactory product. I'm on eight of 18, so, so just so you know. Um, yeah, I got five minutes. Um, this was supposed to be 30 minutes. Katie told me it was 15, so I'm gonna roll through it. 2005 rules, and I'll, I'll speak on the high points. 2005 rules basically said that you have to do in a confining unit, confining formation basically says we have multiple aquifers within one substructure, so we've got a, Impermeable, bar impermeable barrier between those substructure. Um, rules and regulations require that you isolate those. Very long story short, they allowed for a cross section of grout that needed to be centralized, um, no more than 50 feet. So you could grout for 40, but if you ran a centralizer, you had to put your centralizer every 50. So the minimum standard says I can grout 40, but the minimum standard for centralizers was I can do 50. Do you think a centralizer got placed in that water well? Anybody? Think about that. Didn't happen. Annular space also is another thing. Um, 
Basically, they had a, an inch and three-eighths annular space. An inch and three-eighths annular space is half the width of this for the total annular space around the casing. So larger than the casing diameter, we have half that distance, two fingers wide, and we're playing around at 1,400 feet, and we're saying that we're going to grout these things properly in cross sections. Steve's going to kill me. Um, basically, the, the ID um, of the well itself needs to be identified. How can we put product down there? What can we do? What can we do with the well when we're done? So it defines kind of the, basically you start with what do I want to do with it? Where does it go? Very long story short, we spent years and years and years putting this together. 2016 construction rules, we fought like crazy to get four and a half inch, to get one half inch inside dimension to allow for a four inch pump, which is three and seven eighths inches, to be actually placed in a water well one time and pulled out again the next time it surfaced. Uh, the old rules and regulations from 2005 in, in the particular location that I spoke about with confining units, nine out of 10 of those pumps, once they placed in the well the very first time, the first time they failed, the well was done. You couldn't pull the pump back out. So we changed that. Uh, you know, I'll talk about some successes here. Right here, I talked about uh, the lady in the front here. I talked about this difference. So we went from one and three eighths. This is, this is numerous meetings. This is a, a two or three year process. We went through a number of different meetings. We started with an inch and three eighths. We asked for three, we ended up with two. And they wouldn't talk about, they would not talk about the outside dimension of the casing or coupler. It was only the casing. They didn't want to identify the coupler. They wanted that gray area. So we fought like crazy. Uh, it was a bloody battle. I still have a target on my back in Colorado for the things that I've done to those people. Um, long story short, again, that's a confined unit, how it was applied. It, for those of you that can actually see the slide uh, and understand construction principles, they would be allowed to tremie that grout in those confining units without a centralizer with spacing less than this wide at 1,400 feet deep. It's practically and physically impossible to do, yet the logs would indicate that they had done it just fine. There are thousands of water wells constructed through confining units in Colorado that, that look exactly like that. So that's why I fought so hard. That's why that big ass target's on my back. Um, what we ended up with, essentially we said, hey, 60 feet, you gotta have centralizer. You gotta have two centralizers. So we got that done. Right there, are the two confining units, guess what you gotta do? You can't just separate them with two chunks of 50 or two chunks of 60 or two chunks of 40 or whatever you can get down there through a half inch tremie pipe. You ever pump 15.4 pound grout through a half inch tremie pipe? Can't do it. Well, you can, but not for very long. So what we were able to do, we got some stuff done. This right here, I think, is one of our big, biggest boxes. Um, what we accomplished, was in the Laramie Fox Hill, we basically said, here's, here's confining units that the topper production allows for us to construct at depth. There's a lot of coal, there's a lot of nasties in between. Um, I'm down to a minute. A lot of nasties in between, but essentially one of the biggest boxes we checked was that we required topper production, grout, clear to surface and everything needed to be centralized. So we fought from an inch and three eighths to two. We got an annular space. We required this, they centralize it, and we're able to protect it at least to surface in this particular situation. Uh, standard, why it's important. You guys probably understood from my talk why it is important. Um, how does it play? To me, standards are black and white. Rules and regulations are kind of black and gray. Best practices, there's some white, there's some green. Practical application, actual practice, acceptable results, those are all different things. And those all speak directly to the integrity of the individual doing it and the dollars that are spent to accommodate it. So I guess I'll end here. Um, this is kind of some adventures, NGWA. I, I would uh, be remiss if I didn't have a shameless plug for NGWA. Uh, we are better together. We certainly have accomplished a lot. Um, we have some fun, as you can see. We have some adventures. And uh, the, the top left, kind of how I started out a whole long time ago. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Todd.
So our, our last speaker um, is David Hendrick, who's from Minnesota. And uh, some of you who are here the last time remember uh, David was our presenter then and uh, also going to be president of NGWA. Past. Now you're past president of NGWA. Yeah. So, um, yeah, um, you're our last guy. Yeah, as uh, Steve said, I'm kind of moving into the has-been category across from my volunteer career, at least. Um, all right, big green button. That is easy. So one of the things that uh, title of talk here is private wells, a dependable resource. One thing that I've kind of ran into over the last several years in particular is a lot of um, questions about private wells and their suitability as a, as a water supply. Um, why we might want to look at other options and, and trying to figure out, you know, I've tried to figure out what are these underlying concerns that, that people have about uh, accepting private wells as a, as a suitable source. Because in my experience, when they're treated well and people really consider about the end product they're delivering to their customer, uh, private wells are really one of the most suitable water resources you can have as long as you've got water availability and uh, things of that nature. So, uh, moving along, I am. David Hendrick, Bergeson Caswell Incorporated. Bergeson Caswell is a water well drilling company that was founded in 1948. We're a full service water well contractor that does everything from municipal, uh, commercial, residential, environmental, geothermal, irrigation. Um, we touch a lot of different aspects of groundwater, everything from the protection to the delivery to the treatment of water and a bunch of different systems and applications. Uh, I am the current president of Bergerson Caswell, vice president of Thermal Dynamics and Precision Geothermal, which are two geothermal uh, technology companies that kind of support that market. I'm a past president of the NGWA Board of Directors and the current president of the Minnesota Water Well Association. Um, some of the pictures up here are some of my, some of the good times that I've had and some of the big decisions and opportunities that, to, to really collaborate with people at NGWA. Um, picture on the lower left is when we gathered to uh, interview and select our, our new CEO, Terry Morris. Um, bottom right-hand quarter is, uh, is a first where, where I handed the gavel over to a member from the scientist and engineer section of our organization, which is the first time that there was a president from another organization, or from, from another section um, uh, for in our organization. So um, we, Todd, Jeff, I, uh, and Richard, we've all really worked to, to really own that better together message and really bring as many people together to make good decisions for the groundwater, the groundwater industry and the people that it affects. So the three topics I'm gonna kind of focus in on today are gonna to be um, ways that maybe health officials and scientists, engineers and contractors can work together um, to improve uh, the quality uh, and decisions that are made about groundwater. So we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about uh, developing contractors and information conduit, uh, interging, uh, emerging contaminants and private water systems, and then promoting best fit and best use of groundwater resources. One of the things that I would routinely run into um, doing panels and listening to other talks is I would hear a lot of regulators ask, yeah, we've got, you know, like New Jersey said, we've got one point some million private well users. Minnesota's got 1.2 million private well users. And everybody struggles, but how do we contact these people? And everyone kind of forgets that the water well contractor is a perfect conduit to communicate with homeowners. Um, Yeah, we're kind of a built-in communication channel. We've already built the trust and the relationship with the homeowner. Uh, we all know that some home, some owners and well owners um, are a little reticent to just invite the government in to, to you know, scope out the place. Um, but, you know, the contracting community has already built that bridge. So why not try to develop the contractor as a resource? Um, and so you can deliver your message, gather information, so we can make good policy decisions and try to improve the quality of water being delivered to, to well users. And to do that, you kind of have to start from the beginning a little bit. 
Uh, think about it in the stages of consciousness. You know, a lot of water well contractors are, are unconsciously incompetent about the issue that might be facing a water user. You know, as, as Jeff said, we're doing a lot of different things. Sitting down to read the latest journal on emerging contaminants in groundwater probably isn't one of those things. So we need someone to come in, bring that information, start from scratch, know that you're already educated on the topic. You've, you know, you've really, you filled the cup already. Realize that their cup might be empty. Or, or be filled with misconceptions. So you're gonna have to start from scratch and try to build that knowledge base up. It can be done because even thinking back to our conference two years ago, I knew very little about arsenic in groundwater um, heading into our conference of 2017. But through some of the research that the Minnesota Department of Health did and then the concentration of information at this conference in 2017, I was able to take my knowledge of, of arsenic and groundwater from here, you know, to, to a pretty substantial level. And I'm able to relay that to other people in my industry, and now we're, we're, we're taking the issue um, quite a bit more seriously. You understand why the, the MCLs went from 50 to 10. You understand all this, this backdrop information that before was just like, well, do it because we said so. Well, if we can actually fill in some of the information gap behind, behind the people that are delivering the message, we should be able to um, have a better impact and deliver a better product for private well users. Um, emerging contaminants. So, you know, Minnesota has a PFAS issue. A lot of states have PFAS issues. Our PFAS issues aren't like Michigan's PFAS issues, um, but they do affect primarily a, a big chunk of the east metro area around Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, as well as some other outlying areas across the state. Um, I kind of, you know, because of my involvement with NGWA and being able to travel around and talk to a lot of people, I kind of knew how PFAS was emerging in, in the, you know, in the water sphere. Uh, but still, even having all that advanced knowledge, it still kind of ended up being a, a, a real, you know, a, the, the fire alarm just sounded. You know, it's like one day everything's fine, the next day everybody's going to die from PFAS. And there wasn't really any priming of what I would call like the first responders. So like I said, 20 some percent of Minnesotans are getting their drinking water from private water systems. There wasn't really any training ahead of the news that came out about PFAS. And so really kind of think about who are the people that are gonna be responding to these, these water users? Who's gonna be able to help them with solutions when this comes out? Because we did not do a great job of preparing the contracting community for what was gonna come down the pipe and with PFAS. So, you know, and when we, you know, as we've been looking for PFAS, we've been finding what, Gen X, we've been finding all these other contaminants. So this is gonna be a problem you know, moving forward. I'm sure there's other stuff that we're doing to the planet today that we're gonna find out wasn't a very good idea 20 years from now. So always think about who's gonna be responding, who do we need to train, and how can we get that information in their hands so that they can have more informed customers? Because it really will help, it'll help you as well. I mean, that if we're, if the contract community fully understands the issue and they've got the proper information that they're giving to water users, then that makes your job a lot easier when you're trying to help fit solutions to people's issues. Um, and, and part of that is, you know, sometimes water well contractors think that, well, it's my job to put the pipe in the ground and, and get water to the house, and then everything after that is, is somebody else's problem. Encouraging contractors to take a little more responsibility, think about what's actually being delivered at the tap. Um, there's usually always a treatment option for whatever ails the water in an area, but um, sometimes the contracting part of the world isn't encouraged to take that step. So not, you know, not, I don't wanna say that we haven't been invited to it, but sometimes I think that's how people think, is that they have to be invited in order to be a part of that solution. And when emerging contaminants pop up, every policy maker that I've heard talk about PFAS in particular, I think the verbiage they use is something like uh, temporary treatment solutions until permanent infrastructure can be put in place. And I've yet to find a time when permanent infrastructure didn't mean a pipeline of some sort. Um, even though there might be other water resources available, there might be treatment options, somehow the private system immediately kind of gets thrown under the bus as a completely unsuitable water resource. 
And I would say that the people in this room might be able to help contribute to that conversation about are there ways that we can protect and preserve um, people's water systems. And this one kind of, uh, I have my own ordinance issue. Sometimes ordinances can be good, sometimes ordinances can make no sense at all. Um, I've always been a person that, okay, so like I said, Bergerson Caswell covers the gamut of water systems. And quite frankly, commercial municipal systems are probably one of the, uh, one of the healthier sides of our company. Uh, but I've always thought about groundwater and, it's, and using it in the most appropriate fashion. Um, in Minnesota right now, we have municipalities that are just kind of outright ordinancing out water wells because they usually through their wellhead protection program, they view the well as a, as a potential contamination source. And I really kind of question where the data comes from on that because like our, our the gentleman from New York was talking about earlier, it's like, well, yes, we found all these issues with these wells, but a lot of them were pre-code. A lot of the issues with water wells really happened in pre-code wells. I think there's a stat that the MDH has in Minnesota that says something on the order of 90, some percent of wells that are inspected in the state pass inspection. So the code is improved, the good codes, good standards, improve the health and the quality of water systems. So how we continue to look at them as contamination sources and, and wellhead protection plans to me is, is kind of um, nonsensical. And then beyond that, does it really make a lot of sense to take, you know, deep, uh, old water, pump it to the surface, treat it, chlorinate it, fluorinate it, and sprinkle it on your lawn? To me, it seems like a, a pretty big waste of energy, resources. You know, we should really look at these, these non-consumptive uses of waters and figure out, you know, what is the best water resource? Because people have tried to stratify best use, try to, try to do like tiered water systems, um, things like that. The only thing that I've seen in tiered water systems is that the guy who can write the check to water his lawn writes the check to water his lawn and the person that needs the water is unduly burdened uh, by a tiered water rate structure. So really I think we can make good water use decisions without having to try to, all, try to use all these other nonsensical mechanisms to try to manipulate people to, to change their behaviors. And so I think um, you know, what can we do together? I think if all of our industries, like Jeff said, you know, talk, communicate, be open, you know, and really, really work on, on some big, broad goals, um, you know, we could easily improve drinking water quality, protect the resource, develop better information resources for, for consumers, um, and develop a, a better support network for everyone. Because realistically, I think we all have an expertise that we bring to these conversations. It's important that we bring all those voices together so we can make really good decisions, great codes, great standards, uh, and really healthy water users. Okay, so um, what we're going to do for the rest of the time, we've got, uh, how much time do we have here? It's 219. Oh, Gary's going to talk at 245, I think, right? Yeah, so we've got till 245, almost 30 minutes. Um, we're going to go through the questions we've got on Slido. Uh, obviously, a lot more of you are using it. The first question has uh, 47 up likes, whatever you call it. <laughs> So, um, and of course, it's about uh, PFAs. And uh, so I want to caveat this. It says, what do you do when you encounter PFAs in a new well? Um, I would imagine none of you test for PFAs when you drill a new well. That's not a requirement by law. Uh, it's very hard to test for. Uh, so I don't know um, who asked the original question. Obviously, PFAs are a big issue. We have someone talking about it tomorrow. Um, but any thoughts on? if you think there might be PFAs in a well when you do drill it. Uh, and all of those mics should be on. Right, guys? Yeah. Who's? Yeah, I have, I have not encountered PFAs in a new well, but we have uh, fairly reliable maps in, in Minnesota where we know we could encounter it. Um, and I'm pretty sure that I would just call my health department and say, hey, I'm going to be over in an area where I know that it could hit PFAS. Where do I send these tests to? Because I know we've got... I know the number of labs is going to be increasing this year, but I think even Minnesota only has one or two labs that can test for it. So 
Um, the knowledge is there, the execution, just haven't had to practice it yet. Actually, I was supposed to drill a well last fall, and we got a hold on it from the state because it's close to the airport there in Alpena where there's a PFOS plume that's documented. Uh, we put, got a hold put on it. This spring there was talk about double casing, cement grout, confining layer. The owner had a cottage about, this is a log home he built on a little island out in the swamp. And he's got a cottage on the edge of it at a four inch well. They tested that for PFOS and they come back negative. So we went in and pulled the pump and didn't even have to run the camera down because it was only 31 feet deep. Uh, just barely a legal well in Michigan and it had no PFOS in it. So now we went back to the, the, the table and, and we're looking at it and what we're gonna do is we're gonna drill a test hole to see if we can find a confining layer down. Uh, this is a, a limestone area, probably hit the limestone between 60 and 90 feet here. Uh, and they know across the river there was a fuel tanker that flipped over and caught fire and the Air, Air Force sent their foam truck over there and put the fire out with it. So now there's 40, 50 foot limestone wells with PFAS in it along Long Rapids Road across the river from where I'm drilling. So it's all conjecture right now until we can figure out exactly where this, this, this groundwater flow is going. Uh, so that, that's what we're running into is a lot of, uh, you know, 10 pounds of uh, precaution yeah. is uh, worth a pound of cure. So that's, that's what we're at right now. Nobody knows. We've been, well, I guess we're going to use your microphone. They all on? We've, we've been pretty fortunate in my part of the world. Uh, in southern Vermont, they're having a lot of fun with PFAS, and they're having it in some of the other areas where uh, the overburden uh, doesn't have a good confining layer, and it can mingle with the groundwater. Uh, we have one right now that I know of in the town of Warren in a school. Uh, they think it came from the wax off the gym floor that was disposed of on site over time. Uh, we thought maybe we had it in electrical tape. Uh, they tested a piece of 3M Temflex 1700 electrical tape, and it came back positive with PFAS. Uh, we gave them a new sample. They took the new sample in, and the new sample was undetectable. So I think we may have dodged a bullet there in the industry uh, that, that we aren't using something that has it. So I think you know, the, the, the whole PFAS talk is... is we, we haven't learned yet where it is uh, completely. Uh, and it, it, so far, I'm fortunate in my world that we have not had to deal with it. Uh, that we're going to have to in Warren, um, which will, I'm assuming going to be some sort of a, the same way we mitigated, uh, you know, uh, gasoline, uh, benzene, um, and, those other, and the other chemicals that are really soluble and really mobile in the soils that we're going to have to case out and grout, you know, multiple lengths of casing and try to find another supply on site somewhere, most likely at a deeper depth. Sure. So, you know, PFOS is one that's been coming around for, for a while. I think it's actually one of our topics uh, at NGWA and the five-year plan, and Lauren will attest to this. I mean, it's one of the primary uh, concerns that NGWA has, has right now. Uh, you know, my personal uh, perspective, uh, it's made the press in Boulder, Colorado, and as you can imagine, you know, it's, you don't know quite what to read, but essentially what happened is some wells up Sugarloaf uh, were found and tested uh, close to a fire station, so they've determined that it's probably the fire station that's the source. Uh, the scary part for me, I think, is nobody really understands what those thresholds needs to look like yet, and they're measuring in parts per trillion. So I think in all reality, if you look for it, you're going to find it everywhere. And I think that's really the, the larger challenge is not does it exist and how best do we mitigate or how best do we treat it, but just how prevalent will, will it become once people start actively testing. So I think that's gonna be my, my biggest concern. But uh, you know, Boulder, Colorado, a, a few people's hair were on fire for, for about a week's time and it's kind of fallen off the radar. I'm sure that, that one neighborhood that was affected, uh, you know, there certainly is still f front and foremost, first and center. Um, 
trying to understand, A, what, what is it, you know, what are those thresholds, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. So I think PFOS right now is, is uh, what is that, it's the upcoming um, technology, I believe, that, that is going to uh, hopefully provide for, for uh, you know, some mitigation, at least some better understanding. Um, but I think really when you're measuring anything in parts per trillion, you know, we touch the water glass, right, and, and it could well be there. So I, I think it's uh, certainly something we need to pay attention to. All right, so I'm going to move on. Um, and, yeah, if, if, so we've touched on the importance of drilling wells, but how often are, are you guys c contacted about the appropriate way to close a well or asked to handle abandoned wells? You guys have much of an abandoned well business is really the question. I know it's certainly an issue in Illinois and probably almost every state. Well, you know, that, that particular question right there, I just finished my talk talking about confining units in a deep aquifer in the Denver Basin with uh, three, sometimes four distinctly different uh, water aquifers in the same borehole. Um, the old rules and regulations in the state of Colorado allowed for some things to happen that, that, that I think fundamentally changed uh, the nature of that entire formation. Uh, the Fox Hill Sandstone, that's why we were so uh, adamant about uh, trying to create a rule and regulation that A, allowed for the, the practical application of the process. Uh, that's why I fought for annular space. I fought really hard for annular space because as, drilling, as drillers, you guys understand that, uh, you know, annular space is your friend. It, it's, it saves the day when things go south. It, it really allows you the latitude to, uh, rather than chase the minimum standard, maybe end up at the minimum standard for a best case. But if you shoot for the man, minimum standard, oftentimes you're going to find less than that. So from the abandonment perspective, consider all those thousands of wells that were drilled in those confining units in the, in the Denver Basin that were not, A, properly grouted to start with, that, B, cross several confining units oftentimes in the same hole. And they got pumps stuck at depth, and they really don't have a good way to abandon them. There's, there's literally thousands of those water wells out there in the state of Colorado right now that have exactly that challenge. And nobody's doing anything about it, though, right? Well, nobody's doing anything about it. The regulatory body in the state of Colorado, the AG's office, everything has to go through the AG's office. They say we don't have the resources. We have a well inspection program that could actually uh, chase it, but they, they either elect not to or they don't have the resources. So. They, they believe that uh, by ignoring it, maybe it's going to get better somehow, but no, it's, it's pretty scary, uh, I think, from a, an abandonment perspective. Uh, you know, this is one that, that I think will, well, it's already fundamentally changed that formation. I think certainly in the future, they will come to realize just how badly it, it did. David? Get right into it. All right. So I'm lucky to be in a state that actually has an award-winning uh, well sealing program. We actually seal more wells than we drill every year. Wow. Uh, everything from you know your old three-inch cable tool well uh, all the way up to larger diameters, 18, 24, where we actually do a lot of perforating uh, and cement grouting of those wells. So um, I think it's I think abandoned wells, wells that are no longer in use. I'm all for a program that, that eliminates those because they are just their their pathways and, and conduits for contamination. Um, we need to get them sealed up and, and get a, get those access points plugged off. Well, in Michigan, we have to abandon the on a replacement well. We have to abandon the old well. Uh, make every attempt to abandon it. Uh, make every attempt to remove any stock pumps. Uh, sometimes it can be shocking for the homeowner because that can cost more than a new well. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had wells buried underneath houses, two pipe jet, uh, two inch wells, where you actually got to circulate reverse through the lines, cement mixture, and continually make it heavier and heavier and heavier until it goes to refusal. So you're, you're recirculating back down the return side and up through the jet nozzle. And you'll, you'll get up close to 9, 10 pounds cement before she goes to refusal. But you really have to watch your pressures when you do that. Good. Okay. So, yeah, Jeff, you get the next one. Uh, what's your experience with well drillers in other states when it comes to working better together in good communication? 
I've actually found, except for where Todd is, it's a really collaborative group. <laughs> Mr. T Bullseye target on my back. Um, really, you can tell, uh, I can tell uh, as a contractor, and I'm sure you can too, you can see the people that, the, the contractors in the area that are out at their annual state meeting, they're, they're really making an effort to maintain their CEUs, they're involved in, in some sort of, uh, you know, community activities, um, and you don't, you don't get the calls on them, right? You get a random call once in a while, nobody's perfect, I'm gonna get calls on me because somebody disagrees with what I said or did, and it's just a fact of life. But the ones that are really trying to do the right thing out there are pretty well involved. Um, so, uh, you know, I found it to be nationwide a positive experience in, in collaboration. But one of the things that always stands out at the National Groundwater Association is people say, well, I wasn't asked. Nobody asked me. So I think that in order to get a response, sometimes you have to ask the question. Uh, because as a contracting community, a lot of times if we're not asked, if we're not asked to be involved, then they, they don't step forward to be involved. Okay, well, here's a loaded question. Oh, uh, well, let's just stick with that one. So speak about industry integrity and those that give drillers a bad name. And I think, hmm. Uh, I think I just answered that. I think you did too. <laughs> you know, it's the what? ones that are involved, right? The ones yeah. that aren't involved and are the ones that don't participate. They play by themselves, they play by their rules, and, and they don't get along as well. Well, to me, it's, there's no, it's no different than any other industry. You have good apples and bad apples, and it's just sometimes the bad apples have more, end up having more influence on how other people view them. So. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I mean, you yeah. can't find it, you're not gonna find an industry in this, this world that's you know, full of class A performers. Right. So doing your best to empower the ones that, that really wanna get with the program and develop and be better <coughs> and try to get everybody else to kind of come along kicking and screaming if they must, uh, but the reality is we, we don't have a good mechanism. I think the only good mechanism is, is logical enforcement mechanisms. You know, having health officials get out there and really, if there's people that aren't doing it right, uh, just be a tag along. You know, if they, you see one of their jobs pop up, go go to it. Um, I think that's really, I don't know if there's a lot of power inside the community to, to convince people to change. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, and, and Jeff mentioned his dad does things the same way. I ran into a driller who's just getting ready to retire who he won't change what he does because that's the way he's just always done it. And so uh, I'm looking forward to him retiring, to be honest. So, because uh, it's a frustration for me when I can't get a log from the guy. But that's, yeah. Okay, so moving on. Um, for Jeff, is uh, a Vermont specialty plumber license required for water treatment installations? Yes, it is. Um, Vermont, the, the health department, uh, I'm going to say it is the fire marshal has jurisdiction over um, 10 feet outside the building to inside the building. In a residential application, you don't need to be licensed or permitted. Um, you're supposed to be, but nobody polices it because on the single family residence, that's also out of their jurisdiction. So it's kind of like the honor system. When you get into a commercial building, which is anything with multiple units or something else attached to it, whether it's a home office, doesn't matter what it is. Once it triggers non-residential, just single family residential on its own lot, then a permit is required uh, for the installation of water treatments. Also required for changing of pressure tanks and controls inside the building. So we kind of killed two birds with one stone when we got that specialty license, the PSO3, um, that we can now go into commercial buildings and we can do pressure vessels, you know, in the, in the pumping systems in commercial buildings along with water treatment. Great. Okay, so uh, what's the best entity to inform drillers about contaminants? Receptivity has been an issue, and I, I'm, you know, again, that goes back to good apples and bad apples. I'm sure if they talk to, you know, well, I think we can go on and on about, you know, the, the good apples and the bad apples. And, and you know, to Jeff's point, I'll use the Colorado analogy again. We, we spent years working on rules and regulations in the state of Colorado, the Colorado Water Well Contractors Association, a number of individuals, active stakeholders, engineers, 
you know, most importantly, the staff at the Division of Water Resources. And at the end of that process, at the end of that process, after years of, of meeting after meeting after meeting and, and hammering out what we anticipated the rules would look like, and ironically, they were very close to the NGWA standard that we reached. Um, at the very last public meeting, uh, you know, a handful of people showed up that had the state engineer's office uh, had their ear, and they slanted the board uh, to a vote that basically threw the entire process under the bus. So it was scramble at that point, um, get the best you can get in that particular situation. So, you know, even the best plans sure. don't work that way. The, the individual on the other end, the receiving end, if you will, of those rules and regulations or those standards or that, you know, the isolated uh, variance request, what have you, uh, the individual has to be receptive, obviously, of the the consequences and, uh, you know, contemplate how best to, to meet with that expectation. I think the receptivity is where this is very much a person to person business. So while mm -hmm. the water well contracting community is so, so trying to fill people in a lecture hall and just expect your message to sink in is probably not a, a logical expectation. So really, you know, every state, Almost every state has some form of trade show for water well contractors going there, uh, being on their show floor, talking to people one on one, um, you know, showing that up. It's a it's a care thing. It's not a we're, it's not a hammer and nail. You're not it's not that we're here to just pound on you. But here's why and how you could you can make people's lives better. Um, I think I think we just need to message it a little differently, uh, and I think you'll find more receptivity. Continuing education. It should be a requirement. A lot of states don't have it, uh, but that's that's how you're going to get the drillers to the seminars and the shows to be informed about this. That's that's just it. That's a no, that's a good point, and you can see it in the states that have it. You certainly can. Okay, so um, how can health officials better support drillers when acting as a bridge? Uh, with dissatisfied homeowners, aside from trying to explain <laughs> nature hates everything. Uh, <laughs> that's an interesting take. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I'd like to lead that one. <laughs> Communication, does that ring a bell? Mm. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it's the, the health department officials, the regulatory officials, better understanding of what we do in the field and that means maybe spending some time out there with us in the field, uh, spend some time in our office. I always open and welcome anybody that wants to come out on the operation. We got nothing to hide, uh, and we're gonna do the best we can every day anyway. And I think we have that to some degree. So, um, you know, to understand what's going on out there and reach out to that, that driller and say, hey, we got this little issue, let's talk about this. What do you think's going on out there? And try to come to some satisfactory conclusion that, that you can give back to the homeowner that's been talked about and, and agreed upon, hopefully, between you and the contractor. Yeah, and the other thing I'll add, from the work that I've done over the last, I don't know, uh, well, I've worked with wells and well owners for 30 years, but uh, especially with our private well program, what I've learned working with health officials is that they understand the health side a lot better than I do, and there's certainly things I don't understand, but there's certainly a lot of things about groundwater that health officials don't understand, multiple aquifers, uh, the fact that, you know, um, we have people come to us and say, well, this county has a higher instance of cancer. It must be because of the groundwater, and then we show them a map that shows that there's four different aquifers with different chemistry in the same county, and you can't use that data that way. Um, so that's also the point of all this, is that really it needs to be a team. You need to have health people and groundwater people and, and contractors all working together because there's certainly things everyone thinks they may know that they really don't. Uh, so yeah, that's my take on that. My recommendation would be don't put yourself in the middle of that conversation in the first place. I remember <laughs> Lynn from Wyoming. Yeah. Lynn was uh, led their health department out in Wyoming for, for years or years. And she would just just absolutely try to make everybody happy. And it's like, that's, let them, you know, review them on Yelp. Tell them if it's not code compliant, if it's a code compliance issue, well, then you have recourse. But if it's, uh, you know, we don't like, 
you know, there's so many things that people might not be happy with. Uh, just, you know, stick to the code, stick to what your credible voice is, and then, you know. Sure. I think to David's point, um, you know, everyone has a unique perspective, right? And everybody, when they have to part with their hard-earned hard money, their perspective can change based on how much hard-earned money they have to play with. So, you know, I understand that. I certainly understand that. And, and, you know, I think one of the first things that you have to realize is you can't be all things for all people. But what we can be, I think, as an industry is, uh, you know, strict proponents for the resource. And if, if you front with that answer to the question, if you will, oftentimes the money question goes away. You know, at that point, you've got something to talk about. And honestly, if you're not talking about protecting the resource and taking care of your customer, and finding a good means or way to do so, uh, you're having the wrong okay. conversation. If the very first thing you're talking about is how much does a well cost, you're, you're probably, uh, you should, probably shouldn't be talking about a water well. And if somebody gives you a price off the top of their head five minutes into the conversation, that's probably a contractor you don't want to hire. Okay, so we only have a few more minutes. And, and the next question, um, you know, that's a very arbitrary one, to be honest, because um, I know as someone who, we house all the state's well logs in Illinois, and we have rock drillers who will blow through 30 feet of sand uh, to drill a rock well instead of putting it in the sand and gravel, um, because that's what they're used to doing, and they never used a screen in their life, and they're proud of it. So, uh, and they call it overburden, and that's it. So uh, that's the geologic log that they provide. Uh, so that goes back to me, to training and uh, having continued education for drillers to teach them that they really need to fill out the geology. But I don't know if you have any additional thoughts. Um, everybody's logs are different. That's the <laughs> bottom line. So um, go ahead. I've got the next question to you. Oh, there you go. That one. Yeah, go ahead, right at it. Just tell them to look at their bids, throw out the bottom two, and then hire the next one, and they'll find a good well driller. <laughs> So make sure they get three bids at least, right? I yeah. got a better. I got a better idea. Go to the NGWA website and only hire a master groundwater contractor. So yeah, for those that aren't aware, the NGWA does have its own program uh, where um, you can become a, na uh, a master well driller through NGWA, and it requires you to, to pass a test, I believe. And there's a whole program involved, and it works uh, really well for places like Pennsylvania where they don't have well construction code or they don't license drillers, I believe there's a few counties or at least some areas in the state, and Brian or Todd can correct me if I'm wrong, where you have to be a master, NGW master well driller in order to drill in that county. And so that's the county's attempt. Is that right, Brian? Okay, I, I've been told that, and I don't know if that's true or not. It's not true? Oh, well, there you go. Uh, it seems like a good idea to me, so I've always believed it. Maybe that's what it is. I probably came up to it in my sleep sometime. Anyway, um, but yeah, there is, there is information on NGW's website for the drillers that have gone through that program, and you know, at least they have had the wherewithal to care enough to go about and do those things. Because just like in states where there's not continuing education, there's drillers who never show up at any of those events to learn anything new. They don't care. Even at the Iowa meeting I went to uh, with uh, MAP, uh, there's drillers who never come to those meetings. I sat and had lunch with some of those guys, and uh, yeah, it's frustrating. Um, okay, so last, well, uh, I think that's it. Uh, Will, like I said, there's more questions here. There's still seven questions we haven't answered, or six. Um, we'll get these to these guys, and in the end, we'll try to put all that together on a website, but we need to keep mowing. There's one more talk uh, before break. I do want to remind everybody that uh, Richard put a, co a, a well and I believe a pressure tank, right? Yeah. So when you get a chance at break, go take a look. Uh, at the, It's over there in the corner. And right now, uh, give every, these guys a great hand. Thank you.